<laughs> yes, indeed. Wow. That got louder since this morning. <laughs> Amen. You know, we uh, we constantly need to remind ourselves of the total sufficiency of Jesus Christ for our complete salvation. That truly our remission of sins is through his blood. Truly our forgiveness is through his death. Our life comes through his resurrection from top to bottom. Our salvation is all from Christ and all wrapped up in him. And tonight we are going to be looking at the greatness of his name. I want to bring you a sermon tonight. From Ezekiel, for the sake of his name, we are in Ezekiel chapter 36. And as you turn there, I uh, I discouraged, I guess you could say, a, a sister in the congregation here the other day. Uh, we were we were talking about things and uh, we were talking about planning things and sermon series is being introduced and everything. And I was like, you know, it's, it's just a hard thing because, you know, we're like six months out on everything to just stick some other sermon series in here along the way. I said, for example, we're probably going to be in Ezekiel for at least another six months, maybe another year. And her response was, oh, I don't know if I can handle that. I, I won't give any names. But, uh, <laughs> she is here tonight. So that's good. <laughs> I don't be looking. Uh, Ezekiel is tough. But man, is it also encouraging. And I pray uh, tonight you're going to see two things. You're going to see a great deal of tough Ezekiel, and then you're going to see a great deal of very encouraging Ezekiel. So let's take a look at this in Ezekiel 36, and let's pick up here at verse 16. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, while the house of Israel lived in their land, they defiled it with their conduct and actions. Their behavior before me was like menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath on them because of the blood they had shed on the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered among the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and actions when they came to the nations where they went. They profaned my holy name because it was said about them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have had to leave his land in exile. Then I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, this is what the Lord God says. It is not for your sake that I will act, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profane among the nations where you went. I will honor the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name that you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Yahweh, the declaration of the Lord God, when I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. For I will take you from nations and gather you from all the countries and will bring you into your own land. I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Then you will live in the land that I gave your fathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will summon the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine on you. I will also make the fruit of the trees and the produce of the field plentiful so that you will no longer experience the reproach among nations on account of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you will loathe yourselves for your iniquities and abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act the declaration of the Lord God. Let this be known to you. Be ashamed and humiliated because of your ways, house of Israel. For this is what the Lord God says. On the day I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of everyone who passes by. Then they will say, this land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were once ruined, desolate, and destroyed are now fortified and inhabited. 
Then the nations that remain around you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what, I, what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. This is what the Lord God says. I will respond to the house of Israel and do this for them. I will multiply them like number in a flock. So the ruined cities will be filled with a flock of people, just as the flock of sheep for sacrifice is filled in Jerusalem during its appointed festivals, then they will know that I am the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight as a people needing to hear this word. You have given it to us for our good and our instruction, and I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive it. And Lord, bless me to proclaim it, feeble though my lips may be, that through your power, our hearts, all of our hearts would be touched and our minds opened and that we would see your greatness and your glory, the glory of your name, and come close to you. Father, I think of your word, with which you said that your name is blasphemed among the Gentiles. And I pray that our lives would never be lived in such a way that that could ever be said of us. Help us to live to honor your name, discipline us when we diminish it, and Father, for the sake of your name, deliver us from ourselves, we pray. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. At the beginning of this chapter, the prophet Ezekiel is spoken to by God. And God tells him that all of the mountains of Israel that have been so defiled by Baal worship and Moloch worship and Asherah worship, all of those mountains are going to be cleansed and they're going to be purified. And God told Ezekiel that I'm going to purify these mountains and I'm going to fill it with a righteous people. Righteous mountains filled with righteous people. Amen. And there's the problem for us, right? Because the problem is no one is righteous no, not one. All of us stand before God condemned. I think about the righteousness of God like someone being given a Bible and told, go and do everything written in this book. And so the man goes and he reads the book and he sees that heaven and hell are set before him. And he desires in his heart to fulfill the words of this book, but he just can't. Now don't get me wrong. He doesn't lie. He doesn't cheat on his wife. He doesn't go around cussing, but yet lust rages in his heart like an unstoppable force, the force of the sun rising in the east in the morning, so is lust in his heart. And he looks at his life and he realizes that, hey, he doesn't cuss, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do all those things that we call terrible and bad, but yet he loves his sports more than he loves his God. And he realizes he can't do this. He can't live this word perfectly. There's no way that he can. And so he cries out that someone must do it for him. And the good thing is Jesus Christ steps up and says, I will do it. I will do it, but I'm not going to do it for you. I'm going to do it for my name. See, that's the head of everything that God does. It's all for his glory. It's all for his sake. It's all for his name. And he says right here in Ezekiel that I will do this for the sake of my holy name. He tells us that not only will he be our righteousness, but that he will also give us hearts that crave after righteousness. God saves us for the sake of his holy name. And we can be so thankful that he wants his name to be known and glorified in the world. So let's discover a lot more about this. As we enter our scripture tonight and we look here at first, for the sake of his holy name, we are disciplined. For the sake of his holy name, we are disciplined. The sins of Israel are revealed in all their grotesque uncleanness. When God says to them in verse 17, Son of man, while the house of Israel lived in their land, they defiled it with their conduct and actions. Their behavior before me was like menstrual impurity, defiled and unclean. Israel's bloodshed and idolatry was like 
constantly throwing used Mr. Rags at the feet of Christ and calling it an act of worship. It is an unimaginable scene to take in that such a thing could ever happen by the very people that are known by the name of Yahweh, their God. But that's what they did with every act of worship to Baal. Every drop of innocent blood that hit the ground, Israel was carrying on before God as if he didn't exist and that his name did not matter. This he will not tolerate. And we put ourselves in the same boat as Isaiah when the prophet said that we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousness as, as, is as what? As filthy rags. So we're all in this boat with him. Like Israel before us, so we will often have need to be corrected of God when we live in such a way as to deny him the glory that his name deserves. So consider with me here that discipline is deserved when we diminish God's name. Have you ever diminished God's name in your <coughs> life? It is clear from Scripture that God's desire is to make his name known all over the world. He started out in the Garden of Eden. And what did he do in that garden? He, he put two creatures there made in his image. And he tells them, you go forth and you multiply and you subdue the earth. Why? So that the name of God would be known all over the planet. That's what he wanted. That's what he desired. A planet filled with people all acknowledging his name, all glorifying his name. And of course we know that that's not exactly what happened. So then he took one man, Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I will make my name known to the nations through you and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. And he called out Israel and he told Israel that they are to tell his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. That's first Chronicles 16. He desired this. He wanted this. And God tells Israel here in verse 20 that when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said about them these are the people of the Lord yet they had to leave his land in exile then I had concern for my holy name which the house of Israel profaned among the nations where they went they profaned his name by the idolatry that they got into and the punishment that God gave them for it which was exile into foreign nations and they went into those nations disgracing not only themselves but diminishing the name of their God on account of God says, I've seen what this has done, and I'm acting now, not for your sake, but for the sake of my holy name. Let me read you here an incredible excerpt from a, the writing of a theologian named John B. Taylor. He says, the doctrine expressed in the phrase, I had concern for my holy name, represents the utmost humiliation for the sinner. There is no contradiction for him, the sinner, no respect for his feelings, no love for him as a human being. He stands condemned because of his sins, and he forfeits all claims on God. He is simply a pawn in the chessboard of the world, in which God's prime concern is that all men and nations may know that he is the Lord. Now, friends, I believe you and I need to take pause here tonight. And we need to ask and answer the question. If our hearts desire and make a priority of God's name being made known in this world, is it, it's, is it a priority to us as much as it is to God himself? And just let me take a moment here to, to say that I believe as a church family, I believe that we do have a heart for missions. And I pray that that is translated into an understanding in us all that we are into missions for the purpose of making Jesus famous in the world, right? I mean, if we're doing missions for any other reason, it's the wrong reason. It's for his name's sake. And so we give to missions, and that is great. We need to give to missions. But we also need to be global and the ministry of this church. 
And I don't think we even think in those terms a lot of times, do we? I mean, we, we think of mission trips maybe to Cleveland or somewhere up north or here or there or whatever further north than we are, I should say. Uh, we, we think in those terms, but I don't know that we think of ourselves as being global Christians on missions for making the name of Jesus known in the world. That is the purpose for which you and I have been saved, to glorify Christ here and in eternity when we are with him face to face. It is all about his glory. It is all about his name. And we need this radical change of mind to come into us so that we won't make the mistake that Israel made, which was forgetting that the name of Christ and his glory is our priority, not our own lives and not what we are about. It is all about him and his holy name. And sometimes I know our priorities can get really out of whack. I mean, you and I know the Bible, right? Uh, at least we know these passages that you will be my witnesses where? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and the furthermost ends of the earth. We all know that. We know that Jesus said in Matthew 28, go and make disciples of what? All the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We all know that. We know that we are called to make this a priority. The priority of the church is to make his name known. But our priorities aren't always what they should be, are they? You know, I was reading one time about a man that had a Ferrari, a car, wonderful car, and he took the car and he parked it in front of his friends and he was showing it off for his friends. Look at my Ferrari. Look at my car. He was opening the doors and letting them look in and revving up the engine and everything. He was having a big time. And sort of out of nowhere, this dump truck came and simply demolished that Ferrari. <laughs> and as he's standing there and the police come and everybody comes and He's hollering out, you know, my Ferrari, my Ferrari, even if my Ferrari gets fixed, it won't be right. Nothing will ever be right again. I've lost my Ferrari. And the policeman looked at him and said, man, your priorities are way out of whack. And the man said, what do you mean they're way out of whack? What could be more important than my Ferrari? And the policeman said, your arm has been ripped off in the accident. So the man looks at his arm, and there's no arm there. And he looks up and he cries out, my Rolex, my Rolex. Oh. Oh. Oh, that was pretty good. I had to do it for a second. See, our, our priorities can get really, really messed up. We think our needs and our desires are often the most important things to us and to God. But above and beyond it all, God says, my name being made known in the world is the most important thing. We need discipline when we diminish the name of God. And we need discipline when we become deluded. And we can so very easily. <laughs> Dr. Daniel Block, you hear me throw that name out a lot, right, when the uh, when I'm preaching for Ezekiel, that was one of my, my seminary professors. He, he's wrote uh, a commentary on Ezekiel. The, the first volume's about that thick. The second volume's about that thick. And uh, I've got them both in my office, read them both all the time. He says, quote, The recipients of divine grace are easily deluded into thinking that they are the center of the universe, that their desires determine God's agenda. They may even be offended that sentimental pity toward a person in need takes second place to his concern for his own reputation. But the universal Lord is concerned that all may see his glory and his grace. He acts to preserve the sanctity of his reputation. My secretary and I call that living in a bubble. If you've ever wondered what church workers, the lingo they use during the day, we, we call it living in a bubble. And when you're living in your bubble, you don't see anything outside your, your little life, okay? Like the whole universe, like Saturn and Uranus and everything is really rotating around your little universe. And you can't see outside. 
That's what Dr. Block is saying. That's what God is saying happened here with Israel. They deluded themselves into believing that they were so important, they need not magnify his name. We need to be careful of that. Israel was sent into exile for their sins, and we will be disciplined in various ways for ours as well. And we can be thankful that we are. Because when we are disciplined for our sins, as painful as it can be, it shows us that we belong to God, right? The Bible says the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son whom he receives. And during his discipline, God is dealing with you as sons. I think I've told you before, I had a man tell me one time that God had never disciplined him. And I knew immediately that that man had never read Hebrews uh, because that's exactly what God says he will do to every son that he receives. Why? Because we all mess up. Even though we are in this flesh, even though we are saved, even though we are redeemed, it's impossible to be sinless while in this flesh. And I don't know about you, but that fact makes me want to be certain not to diminish God's name with my life, to not live in such a way that it can be said of me that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. You know, I thought to myself the other day because uh, just here in the last couple of months, we, we've had a lot of trouble in Southern Baptist life. And, and you may not know a lot of it, and it's just as well, really, uh, that you don't. But I'll share it here. You know, the, the president of the convention resigned over some, uh, I'm not exactly for sure what happened, but some sort of sexual impropriety. Uh, one of our uh, presidents, in one of our seminaries, uh, a man I've met and a man I have great admiration for, he, he is one of the key founders of bringing the Southern Baptist Convention back to the inerrancy of the Bible, the infallibility of the Bible. And he's, he's just said and been about a few things with women that he shouldn't have been saying or be about. He's 75 years old and he, he's, at the, you know, he's lived this incredible life, monumentally influential and uh, He's just struggling there. You know, I just, I just thought to myself, what would happen, what would happen if I had an affair? Now, i got to be honest with you, and this is not, like, super spiritual, but the very first thing I thought about is how in the world I could do that to Jennifer. Now, that's wrong. I should, my first thought should be how could I do that to God. I'm just being honest with you. How, how could I do that to Jennifer? How could you come home and look your spouse in the eyes after, after doing something on that organ? And then I thought, man, how, how would you look to God after doing that? And how would you come here and look at you? And how would I parade around in, in our little Woodsville you know, everybody knows me one of two ways. They, they know me either as the preacher at First Baptist or they know me as the fat guy that runs every morning and lost weight. And that's equally as creepy uh, because, you know, you're out here at 5 o'clock in the morning and these cars come along real slow beside you and you're kind of like, uh-oh, you know, oh, oh my God, I've energy left for the sprint because it's about to go down and, you know, the car went the road. Hey, you're doing a great job. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's always good to get the heart pumped. But how how would you? How you know it just it just seems so overwhelming. And, and don't get me wrong, uh, maybe people that have fallen for that. One thing we we kind of think of when they do when they fall to these situations is that they just fell. They could have been battling this for a year or two, and, and finally they just lost the battle. But I'm just sitting there and thinking, what happens to the name of God in my life if I do that? It's humbling. And it's humbling because the men I've told you about are men much further along in their sanctification than me, much more in depth with the Spirit, much more walking in the Spirit of the God for decades. And they they fail. But for the grace of God, there go I. And that's where it comes to. We have to rely on Him. 
because we can't do this on our own. We need someone to do this for us, to give us hearts that can focus on what God is focused on. And thankfully, he in grace gives us exactly what we need. Let me show you this secondly tonight. And for the sake of his holy name, we are delivered. Look at what God says in verse 22. It is not for your sake that I will act, house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you profaned among the nations where you went. I will honor the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. The nations will know that I am Yahweh, the declaration of the Lord, when I demonstrate my holiness through you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will also sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. One cannot help but think of Romans 5, 8, when they read through this passage. God has just said, you profane my name, the name you profane, and he went on about profaning and profaning, and then in the next sentence, he begins to talk about how all of this restoration is going to come to him. It makes me think of Romans 5, 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Yes, Israel had sinned, and so have we. They were unable to do anything in the way of making progress towards the Lord, and neither are we. But glory to God in the highest. God acts in salvation. So note here that he gives us exactly what we need to know him and make him known. Among all the evils and the sins of man, a host of resources has been given to solve all of our problems. We have drug addictions running everywhere. So we fund drug addiction therapies. We have marriages breaking all over the place. So we fund marriage counseling seminars and so forth. We offer all manner of counseling and all manner of books. In fact, here in the last few days, as man is at war with man, we saw this amazing uh, episode of peace taking place between North Korea and South Korea. And I, I watched this. And you have the North Korean leader, and he comes down, and uh, he's, he's crossing the DMZ, and he's, he's in South Korea. The South Korean president comes to him, and they embrace him. And the South president goes to the North, and back and forth they go. And everybody's just in awe and ooing and awing about the peace. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, I, I would so love to believe it. <laughs> but I can't. And it's not because I don't believe in peace. It's not because I don't believe God can bring peace. I will believe it when this happens. When 300,000 of my brothers and sisters in North Korea are no longer persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ, then I will know that the peace is for real and not until then. Mankind tries everything he can to fix and solve our problems, but they continue coming. And when we see it for what it really is, we can't help but agree with Dr. Block when he says that the only solution for the fall of human race is a fundamental cleansing, a heart transplant, and infusion of the divine spirit. That's what we need. This will not be answered in legislation. It will not be answered in overtures of peace. It will not be answered in any of that. What answers this is a new heart an infusion of the Spirit of God, a cleansing. And that's exactly what God is telling us that he's going to give us. But it's not for our benefit only. It is given that finally and gloriously his name might be known in the world. Now observe here that all God gives us towards this end, of all of that we see here first a return to the land. He says in verse 24, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Now, the interesting thing that he uses there, the word that God uses there, is I will bring you from the nations, plural, more than one nation. And the reason that is, that is interesting is because Israel at this time is in one nation, Babylon. But God says, I will bring you out of the nations and bring you into this land. So he's speaking here, not of the immediate situation for Israel, but something in the future. 
And what we are being told here is that God is going to gather all of his people from the nations to himself. And where are we going to plant down? Where will we find ourselves? We'll find ourselves here on Mount Zion. The Bible said in Revelation 14, 1, Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. What a day that will be. When my Jesus I shall see, to look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And with it, we find a cleansing of our sin. Look at verse 25. God says, oh, I will also sprinkle clean water on you. And normally in the Old Testament, when you see this uh, metaphor of sprinkling water or cleansing water, it's referring to the word. So God is saying, I'm going to put my word upon you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. Being cleansed with water is an external rite that follows an internal change of heart. And God is here saying that the day is coming when Israel would be cleansed from her idolatry and all the wickedness associated with it. That's one of my highest hopes for being raised as Jesus was raised. That I will finally be made perfect in heart, mind, and soul along with my body to be able to finally worship him for all eternity as he deserves. Because quite frankly, I have too many idle intrusions into my life right now. Yes, I battle against them. Yes, I fight against them. But they are there. In this day, God is saying, they will be no more. Your heart will not be attracted to them. Your life will not be anchored to this world. It will all be cut free. And we'll worship him and glorify his name as he deserves. And with it, we find here a new heart. And a new spirit. God says in verse 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Amen. This is exactly what we need. This is precisely it. a heart that doesn't lust and long for sin, but a heart that desires righteousness. Oh, how powerful. God is that he can accomplish that which we could never accomplish. The creation of a heart that beats with his and a spirit that is in sync with his spirit. And speaking of his spirit, he will move us to follow him. God says in verse 27, I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. Indeed, my friends, as the Bible tells us, the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. And God says that he will give us a will that follows his law. In fact, he promises in Jeremiah 31 that he's going to write his law upon our hearts that we may follow him internally and not externally looking to cold stone tablets, but that his very law will become who we are and what our hearts are all about. There will still be, yes, a battle between flesh and spirit while we are in this flesh, but we know the solution is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's like Paul, when explaining his inward battles, declares, wretched man that I am, who is able to rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is Christ who rescues us from this body of death and this stone heart that we need removed, that we might follow him. And then God says that we'll live permanently in the land. Then you will live in the land, God says, that I gave your fathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. As surely as God is eternal, so we shall live eternally with him. Never, never again will we be moved. In this life, God may send us who knows where. But when we have that room in the Father's mansion, we will never be moved again. We will never be removed ever from him. Forever and always we shall dwell in the house of the Lord all of our days. And we see here also that we'll have bountiful harvest. Listen to what God says. He says, I will summon grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine on you. Now, we are so blessed in this nation. 
that that really doesn't ring with us like it rung with them. You know, I can never remember a time uh, accepting, you know, a major snowstorm coming when when the, the stores were not packed with everything to eat. 40 different kinds of bread, 25 different types of milk, you know, uh, 57 different types of crackers. It's not enough just to have a cracker. We have to have different types of crackers. You know, tomatoes, we got big tomatoes, we got grape tomatoes, we got cherry tomatoes, we got every tomato you want. All the time. Even in winter, we got strawberries and everything else. But in the ancient lands, famine was a real fear. Israel had known famine one time to the point they had to up and go to Egypt to be saved. So this is a big deal. But God says there will be no more famine. And he compares this land to the land of the Garden of Eden. He is saying that this land will be lush and bountiful and everything you need for all eternity will be right there for the picking. Just go get it. It's right there. And heaven will have no cause for worry because he will always provide for us. And lastly, we see here that we have a loathing of former sins. God says in verse 31, Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that they were not good, and you will loathe yourselves and your iniquities and abominations. A man never comes to hate his sin as he should until he is saved from them through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only when we love our Savior through a new heart and a new spirit given from God to us that we truly understand his agony and pain as he suffered on that cross in our place. And so we come to hate what our sin did to him. And forever and ever and ever and ever in eternity, he will be on the throne as the Lamb with the very marks on his body that testify <coughs> of what he did for us. And it's that love for him that spurs us to know him and to make him known because he reminds us it's not for your sake that I want. We benefit from it, yes, but it's not primarily for us, it's for him. It's for his sake, his name, his glorious name be made known in the world. And this chapter ends with God saying, I will respond to the house of Israel and do this for them. I will multiply them in number like a flock. So the ruined cities will be filled with a flock of people just as the flock of sheep for sacrifice filled in Jerusalem during its appointed festivals. Then they will know that I am the Lord. That is a odd phrase. What does he mean by that? that these lands will be filled with people, just like Jerusalem is filled with people. They will be his flock, just like Jerusalem is filled with flocks that come in to be sacrificed for God. I believe what God is communicating to us here is that in his salvation theology, two things matter. His name and the nations. That's what he's all about. Making his name known in the nations. And he is saying that there will be a people come that will be a living sacrifice for him to make his name known in the world. So the question for you and me is, are we ready to be made living sacrifices like the sheep that filled Jerusalem for the purpose of making him known in the nations. Indeed, the Bible says, for our sakes he became poor that we might become rich. But as John says, your sins have been forgiven you. Why? For his name's sake. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your desire to glorify your name. Thank you for calling us to yourself. Thank you for enriching us with all of these blessings that come from being yours. And thank you for the reminder tonight that this is not about us. It is about you. Give us hearts, God, that are global in their view of making your name known in the world. And may we, your people, do everything for the sake of your name, Lord God, we pray. Lead us, God, to live lives 
that honor you in all that we do so that your name will be exalted. Help us to raise our families in a way that honor you and glorify your name even in our homes. Help us, God, to never diminish your name, to never, Lord, speak it in vain, but to live it out in truth to your glory. For it's all for your sake, God, now and forever. Make us to be living sacrifices, ready and willing to make your name known in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.